Hello everyone, welcome to the Sports Politica podcast. My name is Kerim Zidane, and I'm an investigative journalist who's best known for covering the intersection of sports, power, and politics. I'm also the founder and publisher of the Sports Politica newsletter. So, I finally decided to dip my toes into the podcasting pool after years of delaying this new venture for reasons I can't even explain myself right now as I sit here and record this first episode. I guess I wanted to stay true to my writing craft, whatever that really means. Maybe the time just wasn't right yet. I mean, 2023 really has been a year of change for me. I've gone on to become an independent journalist. I've launched my own publication and newsletter, being Sports Politica. Thousands of you have chosen to subscribe and support this new venture that I've embarked on. So why not pick now as the time to start a new podcast? It seems fitting, even if I've chosen to go and embark on this as a solo venture for the time being. I'm hoping this show would evolve eventually to become an informal show where you can expect a lot of banter from me and interviews with leading experts in the field, whatever the subject of choice will be at the time, and an opportunity to really engage with you, my listeners, my readers, in a more diverse and long-form manner. It is also an opportunity to get personal and tell some of my lesser-known stories from my experiences as a journalist over the past 10 years. For example, one of the questions I get asked most regularly in interviews, as well as by my readers and in emails, is how did you exactly get into covering sports and politics? So this story has almost become a genesis tale for me because I firmly believe that my experiences as a teenager in Egypt, growing up in Egypt, helped shape me to become the person I am today, including my fascination with the intersection of sports and politics. So up until the age of 15, I had grown up as the son of immigrant parents, a doctor and a teacher, and we were living between Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. And Bahrain was this tiny island kingdom that was a causeway away separated by the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. But by the age of 15, I had returned to live in Egypt. And that was a turning point in my life. My cousin was a massive, massive football fan. And by football, I'm referring to what Americans would know as soccer. But my cousin was this massive football fan. And he insisted, Kareem, come watch these games with me. And I and him and vast majority of the Egyptians that you'd ever encounter, our favorite team is a club called Al Ahli. And Al Ahli was truly one of the most recognizable teams in all of Africa. It is also arguably the most successful team in all of Africa, having won the African Champions League more times than any other team in the continent. It is also the mo- by far and away the most popular club in Egypt. As a matter of fact, the average Egyptian that you'll ask will likely tell you that Al Ahli is their favorite thing in the country. And really, given our ongoing crisis, a debt crisis, and a military dictatorship at the helm, the truth is is that Al Ahli might be the only good thing remaining for a vast majority of Egyptians. While I had always grown up as a fan of Al Ahli, I mean, my entire family supported the club. My real fandom with the club began in 2007 which was the year I returned to live in Egypt after spending about 10 years in Bahrain. I'm 15 years old at the time, and the very first football match I attend is Al Ahli's exhibition game with Barcelona. Now, this match was supposed to be a celebration of Al Ahli's 100th year of existence. Yeah, it's an old club, I told you. And this match with Barcelona was supposed to be a culmination and a celebration of everything the club had achieved so far. The stadium was packed. I mean, Al Ahli played its games in Cairo Stadium, and the stadium could take about 90,000 people in official figures, but for the bigger games, like Egypt's big games back in the day, you could easily fit well over 100,000 if people weren't all sitting in seats, with lots of people standing or sitting in the stairways. But in this case, I'd say it was a full crowd of 90,000 people here to watch what was really one of the most legendary Barcelona lineups. Now, for any of you who are football fans, 
you will recognize this team of the Pep Guardiola days, the Samuel Eto'o, the Ronaldinho, and a very, very young Leo Messi. Yes, interestingly enough, my true fandom in sports and football begins with a match that involved a very young Leo Messi. Now, I won't uh, drag you through the details of the match itself, because I'll be honest with you, Egypt's Al Ahly lost quite badly that day. I remember that very clearly. But it wasn't that specific memory that I carry the most. As a matter of fact, I don't really remember much of what took place during the match. I have to watch the highlights sometimes that are available online to really recall what was going on. I do remember, though, at one point, it might have been around halftime or so, I decided to go get something to eat, go to the bathroom, and I'm walking around, and I see police in Egypt start to swarm this one section of the crowd where the ultras of Al Ahli, this uh, group of young hardcore football fans, these really uh, loud, boisterous fans, sat themselves in a section called Tel Tashmel, which was the cheapest seats in the entire stadium. And that was done on purpose. It was because the ultras really came from all walks of life and they wanted to be in a section of the stadium that was accessible to the vast majority of their fans. So Tel Tashmel really became this iconic section. And these ultras, I should mention, had also just started uh, their entire group that year in 2007. Before that, there were no ultras. So what I witness is police start to swarm this section and grab and pull out these different fans and just beat their asses with these batons. Awful, awful beating. Something I had never witnessed before in my entire life. Like, imagine yourself, 15 years old, you're attending this big sports game. It's supposed to be a great, happy family fun. And what you're actually seeing is people who look just like you, your age, being dragged out of the stands and beaten for what appears to be absolutely no reason. That image really, really stuck with me. And over the next few weeks, I would spend more time with my cousin, who was actually a member of this Ultras group at the time. And he started taking me to matches with them. And I would attend matches with the Ultras in that section, in Tel Tashmel, experiencing what to this day I would consider my most memorable and fondest crowd experiences at a game. And I have watched all sorts of sports all over the world including very big football games. But there was something about experiencing Tel Tashmel in Cairo Stadium that I look back on with the greatest of fondness. I'll give you an example. In Ramadan, there was a game we attended once in Ramadan. Don't even ask me who it was against. I have no recollection. But I do remember that because at the time, President Hosni Mubarak was going to be in attendance at the game. He demands, really, and this, and this level of security that's required at the stadiums when a president is going to appear meant that anybody who wanted to attend the game had to be present hours beforehand. And I really mean hours before. Something like four or five hours before the game, you had to be seated there just waiting because the police had to sweep the area, shut down the roads and make and make way for, you know, our pharaoh to arrive and watch the game just at kickoff. So we had to be there quite early, which meant on a day like Ramadan, we had to be there before the breaking of the fast. And as you're sitting there in the crowd, I remember thinking, well, I didn't bring anything to eat. But when it came time for the sun to set, you started seeing people in the crowd, these members of the ultras, get up and start passing around all sorts of snacks and these little plastic bags filled with sahlab, which is an Egyptian drink, basically all sorts of uh, foods and beverages to make sure that everybody who was there had eaten something and was going to be in good spirits for the game. That's the sort of camaraderie that was developed amongst this group. While you might have heard of this ultras terms with other football groups, I mean, it's it's uh, resonates with many hooligan groups around the world. Some of them are actually quite far right and neo-Nazi. But I want to stress here right now that the ultras in Egypt, the ultras Ahlawi of the Al Ahli Football Club, were really nothing like that. The truth is, is that this team was a group of revolutionaries, believe it or not. They found their voice in these stadiums at a time when, as a young person in Egypt, there was no outlet for free expression. There was no way for you to voice your concerns, how you're feeling, your rage, your disenfranchisement from society and from the world. 
There were no job opportunities. There were no prospects for the average person in Egypt. We were heading in a very bad way. And it seemed to us at the time that football was really the only outlet we had to express ourselves. And that's what the ultras were doing. They were carrying all these banners, chanting against the government, against the police brutality that was taking place, that was being inflicted upon them. I was there when they'd raise these banners. I was there when they'd sing songs insulting, you know, the family of one of the big police chiefs who would be touring the stadium at the time standing just at the bottom of the stadium egyptian football stadiums don't just have a football pitch but they'll usually have a track and field course around it and usually the police officers would walk around this track and field section so uh, the police officers i'll never forget them staring up at the crowd almost eyeing them specifically saying that's the one i'm going to pick out later that's the one i'm going to pick out later and the ultras had to get used to this sort of tension and treatment of the police to the point that they actually started getting into street fights with the police picking fights with the police and targeting them and this believe it or not ladies and gentlemen is actually really fascinating because the ultras and this experience they built up in contact with the police between 2007 and 2011 is exactly what made them such a crucial force when it came time for the arab spring i remember that time very very clearly I actually wasn't in Egypt then. I had graduated from high school in Cairo in 2009 and moved to Toronto where I was actually studying at the University of Toronto when the Arab Spring kicked off. I remember watching anxiously, terrified during those first crucial 18 days where Egypt descended into this state of chaos. I really mean chaos. On one of those days, there's a, one of the most famous conflicts that took place during those 18 days before the fall of the Egyptian government was this event called the Battle of the Camels, where Tahrir Square, which was the main square where protesters were gathering, was invaded by thugs on camelback. Only in Egypt could you hear of something like this. And while this sounds funny now, at the time it was anything but because those thugs, they were coming in with their sticks and beating the crap out of people. Again, another reminder of the, just the use of force against the standard Egyptian for speaking out. It's something that I first witnessed with the police officers and the batons attacking regular teenagers watching a football game. And it extends on to, into the protest that we saw just with thugs these times. Meanwhile, the ultras were the ones gathering in the streets in Egypt, helping Helping protesters who had no experience with protesting, with demonstrations, with being on the streets, with police brutality. It was actually the ultras who helped secure certain areas in Egypt, helped make sure that certain streets that were unfamiliar to people were well protected, making sure that people don't get blocked off in an area where they could get tear gassed by the police, which was a regular use of force at the time. As a matter of fact, a woman who would go on to run for the Egyptian presidency, to become the first woman, actually, to run for the Egyptian presidency, her name was Busaina Kemet. She spoke so highly of the ultra saying that during one of the crucial nights of protesting where there was a lot of attacks from the police and the government before the fall of mubarak they were actually crucial to keeping her alive and protecting her she was surrounded by tons of ultras regular teenagers and young adults who were nothing but exceptionally proud football fans who happened to actually love their country and knew what they were up against knew that they were part of an authoritarian regime and wanted to fight against that this is really what I mean when I say it is very difficult to grow up in a place like Egypt and view sports as distinct from politics. I mean, here's my story at the age of 15 telling you that I was just there to attend a football game. And what I actually learned that day was how the police loathed the people that it was supposed to protect and how that connected to the Egyptian government, how the Egyptian government was scared of groups of young men gathering and expressing themselves freely. It was a beautiful thing, but like most beautiful things, they don't last. The revolution did not go our way. As a matter of fact, the political party that was best prepared to take the mantle was the Muslim Brotherhood. And their listeners is where the Egypt that I hoped would emerge from the ashes of the Arab Spring quickly dissipated into nothing more than a hallucination really a dream of sorts that i can't even believe when i look back on that i was naive enough to believe that egypt was going to be free and just and democratic at any point unfortunately within a matter of years the military dictatorship was back in power after a coup d'etat that ousted the muslim brotherhood government the one that people like to call the first democratically elected government in egypt so really democracy stood no chance I, at this point, was still in Toronto, and 
over the next couple of years, I grew very, very bitter about what I was seeing in Egypt. First of which was the immediate imprisonment of nearly 60,000 political prisoners in Egypt. And second of all, and this one is quite crucial for you all to understand, the ultras were designated as a terrorist entity in Egypt. This was the way the Egyptian government could guarantee that it could criminally charge and limit the scope and effectiveness of such a powerful and influential entity of young men in Egypt. They had done nothing wrong that warranted such treatment, but the Egyptian government feared them so much that it was easier to designate them a terrorist entity than to let them thrive and continue to express themselves and gather support amongst young men in Egypt. At this point, I decided my future might not really be in Egypt after all. So I hunkered down and I finished my studies focusing on political science, economic development, and the things that I was still interested in. Remember, I had caught this political bug and I was very fascinated by the world around me. And eventually, I really got interested in mixed martial arts. It was a roommate of mine in university who introduced me to the sport and I decided, you know, I really love writing and the best way to get into writing might not be to start by writing a novel, but maybe to get into this journalism thing and try and run my own blog. This was in the age of blogs. I mean, this is around 2011, right? So I decided to start my own MMA website called The Flying Knee MMA. I know so original, right? And I ran this website for a couple of years and I built a network of mixed martial arts fans around me. This is really at the height of the sport. Twitter was peaking. There were tons of people to interact with. There were events on a regular basis. Everybody was always excited about something. This was the age of Brock Lesnar in the sport. This was really such a exceptional time to be a mixed martial arts fan where it felt like every single event that was put on was very very special and i continued to operate this website until i caught my very first break in march of 2014. an editor for bloody elbow at the time tim burke reached out to me and said if i would be interested in joining the website now bloody elbow was one of the websites that i had been reading since i started becoming an mma fan just a few years earlier and i thought what well, this is such a great opportunity of course i'll take it and i started there and i wasn't making any money when i started and i decided you know what i really want to give this thing a run so i worked as hard as i potentially could and a few things went my way several of the editors that were at the time and bloody elbow had decided to leave there was a massive reshuffling at the website and there were openings available for me suddenly i was an associate editor and a journalist and i was was getting paid a living wage. I mean, it wasn't the greatest living wage, but for someone who was still in university, I mean, at this point, I'm still haven't even taken my final exams in my last year. I was delighted to be making money. So I graduated. I think I, I got my degree in about October 2014. And interestingly enough, about a month later, I decided to interview, I was already interested in Russian mixed martial arts, and I decided to interview the founder of Russia's oldest mixed martial arts promotion, M1 Global. And his name is Vadim Finkelstein. And for old school MMA fans, they'll recognize the name as the person who used to manage the legendary MMA heavyweight Fedor Emelianenko. Now, at the time, Vadim was at a sort of a war of words with the UFC and Dana White, who was trying to secure a fight, a co-promoted fight with Fedor Emelianenko. And in Dana White's words, Vadim was making it very difficult for him. And so was Fedor. So they, they were, Vadim was sort of a notorious name to mix martial arts fan and especially to United States based mixed martial arts fans. So I was fascinated and I wanted to interview him. So I get on the phone with him and he only speaks Russian so he has a translator and the translator is doing the job translating everything for us and then at one point she stops and looks and just says Karim Vadim has a question for you. And, you know, they speak back and forth in Russian for a little bit. And then she turns to me and says, Vadim really likes your voice. Would you like to be the English commentator for our events in Russia? And I mean, I'm floored at this point. I had reached out to Vadim for a simple interview to do one of many stories I was assigned to do that week for Bloody Elbow. And here I was being offered an opportunity to go to Russia. And I know I'm floored, really. And I say, well, can I can I take a moment to think about it? And they smile and say, yeah, you've got a few days. Our next event is going to be in China. Let's see if we can get you in that one. I'm like, whoa, I'm going to China already? Sure. The China event never worked out, but I managed to get a visa, secure a visa to attend an M1 Global event in uh, St. Petersburg in December 2014. Now, I remember this very clearly. It was right before Christmas. 
No way, 10 days before Christmas. It was on December 15th. And I remember that specifically because it was actually during one of Russia's worst financial crises at the time. So the ruble had been in free fall due to like Western sanctions. And I arrived on this day known as Black Tuesday. And Black Tuesday was the day where in the news, this businessman had shot himself in the head in a Moscow hotel and left his last will and testament in a note asking that his ashes be spread over the Black Sea. I remember being in St. Petersburg that very first trip and going on a walk. And while I was on this walk, seeing people gathering in front of ATMs trying to withdraw as much money as they could, and the people who had money in their hands were gathering in front of furniture stores and, you know, electronic stores trying to buy all the pieces of basically physical goods and assets they could because their currency was depreciating so fast it was basically useless they were better off securing it in things like TVs, couches, and you know, coffee makers, whatever it may be. So I clearly knew that I was here at not the greatest time. And my story continues from there, really. I was there for about a week, and the event was one of those mix was one of those M1 global events that was co-promoted with an organization called ACB. And ACB at the time, for those who don't remember this, it was called Absolute Championship Berkut, and it was a Chechen mixed martial arts promotion. What was really interesting is that it was the very first Chechen mixed martial arts promotion, and they had said all sorts of interesting things throughout the year, saying that they are intending to compete with the UFC, they've got the money to back them up. So I was happy to be in Russia to witness this promotion to see what they were up to. I, at the time as well, for those of you who now know me for my reporting about Chechnya, you have to realize that at this time, I'm heading to Russia at what, the age of 22? I know almost nothing about Russia other than the same things you've seen, the same movies, the same, you know, stereotypes. I most certainly did not know what Chechnya was. So I was a naive young man trying his best at this point, trying to be just an MMA journalist. But on my very first night trying to do this commentary gig, I remember sitting down next to my partner at the time. I knew for the most part while I was doing M1 commentary, my commentary partner was a former UFC fighter called Ian Freeman. But for this very first event, my commentary partner was actually the M1 Global matchmaker or one of the matchmakers at the time, and his name is Stannis. So Ian Freeman was on holiday, so couldn't be at that event. So Stannis was there to walk me through my first attempt at commentary, and he was great and wonderful at the time. And I remember us sitting there and sort of practicing and getting through it, doing the prelims, and I was excited. And right before the main card, which had a lot of M1 fighters versus ACB fighters, a lot of Chechen fighters, I remember the crowd went quiet. And I look around and I don't quite understand why the crowd's suddenly quiet. I mean, it's been a boisterous, loud, roary night. And I turn and you see this collection of men with these trimmed, pointy beards walking down and sort of circling the area around the cage and just staring at different people and then you know shaking hands and giving a hug to specific Chechen fighters they were all wearing these same shirts with pictures of Ramzan Kadyrov who I didn't know who Ramzan Kadyrov was at the time the warlord in charge of Chechnya but I would learn very quickly I turned to Stas and I said why has the mood suddenly shifted and he checked and made sure we were on mute and everything and he was just looking very intently in front of him and said let's not talk about these people right now they're not good people now, there could be a world, an alternate universe, where I never asked the question, who are these people? There could be an alternate universe where I wasn't curious at all, and who knows how that universe would have turned out. As we know, that was not what I did. What I actually did was I pestered him and pestered him until he started explaining to me what was happening. This is well after the event I found, and over the next couple of trips to Russia. My second trip was to Moscow, my third was to Orenburg, and then I was back in St. Petersburg. And across all these events, I would talk to Stannis and learn from him, and talk to others in M1 Global and learn from them. And what I found out was that Ramzan Kadyrov was this warlord, as I mentioned, this strong man, this tyrant, with an iron grip over this enclave in the North Caucasus region of Russia called Chechnya. And he was basically shaping this republic in his own image. It was a conservative Sunni Muslim republic, but one where he was actually fostering this love for combat sports. As I had learned that very same year that I was starting to do these events in Russia, Ramzan Kedzirov had just launched his first mixed martial arts fight club, a fight club that will come to be known as Ahmad MMA. 
Now, I wish I could tell you that I immediately started reporting on Ramzan Kadyrov, like a light bulb had gone off over my head, but that's not exactly how this worked. I was really there trying to experience everything there was to experience about Russia. You have to understand that I had only just started with Bloody Elbow, and I'd been there for less than a year at this point. And prior to that, I was just running my own MMA blog. I just graduated from university. I'm not exactly 100% sure what I want to do moving forward. So really, I'm just taking this Russia experience as I could. I ended up doing 12 or so trips to Russia and neighboring countries like Georgia, Azerbaijan. I was in Ingushetia. I was all over Russia. Speaking of Ingushetia, actually, which is the North Caucasus Republic right next to Chechnya, that neighbors Chechnya, I actually ended up watching at part of an MMA event with Yunus Bek Yevkorov, who at the time was the president of Ingushetia. This man cornered me one day as soon as he realized my name was Karim. For some reason, he simply assumed that my name was a Muslim name. I'll give you this, though. In Egypt, there's 10% of the population that's actually Coptic Christian, and Karim is a name that is regularly used for Christians as well. But Yevkorov didn't know that and immediately assumed I was Muslim. I mean... He was right, but that's against the point. And he grabs me and starts introducing me to his entourage as Muslim Canadets, Muslim Canadets, this Muslim Canadian, Muslim Canadian, like I was this unicorn that showed up in Russia and immediately just took me arm in arm, sat me next to him in the front row and said, and just pointed at the cage and said, let's watch. Well, he doesn't really say that. He said something to me in Russian, but I assumed what he said was let's watch. He clearly had no idea that I had commentary duty to do. So, I mean, I stuck around for a match or two. It's still the prelims. Those prelims, very few people really watch that specific portion of the stream. We don't really tend to need to do commentary forward, but we like to get started, Ian and I, to at least be sort of warmed up when the big fights were ready to take place. And I can see Ian sitting there just looking from side to side and he spots me. And he's like, what on what on earth is going on? And I eventually... Eventually, I'm able to get away from this president, trying to do it without, you know, making him look bad. But it was just one of these random situations that I ended up being involved in. Now, mind you, Yevkorov is actually even more relevant now. While he's not currently the president of Ingushetia, he's actually one of the deputy defense ministers of the Russian Federation right now, which means he's one of the people who is currently heavily involved in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, I randomly, as a 22-year-old, attended an MMA event with a man who's currently responsible for invading Ukraine. And I mean, that's really just one of the many random things that I ended up getting into while I was in Russia. I, at one point in one of the early events, went shot for shot with somebody who turned out to be an ex-KGB agent. And actually, we had a hell of a conversation spanning all sorts of topics around the world, including the topic of the quality of the mangoes in Egypt. I remember that very specifically. He, for some reason, was extremely interested in that. But I remember pissing off Russian oligarchs like Ziavuddin Magomedov. Ziavuddin Magomedov was this Dagestani oligarch who had taken a shining to mixed martial arts as well. He had invested in one of the major MMA organizations in Russia, this promotion at the time called Fight Night. And he was also influential with a lot of the UFC's leading Dagestani fighters, including Khabib Nurmagomedov. Now, Khabib wasn't the legend he is now. At this point, he's still rising his way through the lightweight ranks. He's not making that much money. And Ziavuddin Magomedov basically swoops in and becomes his sugar daddy. He pays for the surgeries he needs. He buys him cars. He pays for his travel. He creates a specialized team around Khabib and anoints Khabib as this president of the club. He's basically trying to emulate Ramzan Kadyrov, but outside of Chechnya. And I wrote many articles about Magomedov's past, his shady dealings, his attempts to sort of ingratiate himself to Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia. And I would find out years later from a person who worked as sort of Ziavuddin Magomedov's English... Uh, English teacher and English tutor that Magomedov would bring pull out my articles that I wrote for Bloody Elbow and other outlets about him and would read them and apparently he was utterly furious about these articles utterly furious Magomedov never really had a chance though to act upon his distaste for me let's say uh, he was actually arrested in Russia under these politically motivated circumstances and charges of racketeering and embezzlement of state funds and he was sentenced to really an unprecedented term of 19 years in prison despite there being very little evidence of this racketeering and embezzlement so he 
prior to this was the owner of one of lar Russia's largest diversified private holdings, this group called uh, Suma Group. It had all sorts of investments in port logistics, transport, infrastructure, construction. He was really quite influential and his arrest really had a significant impact on the Russian mixed martial arts landscape. There were really very few people left. There was M1 Global, the organization that I was doing commentary for, and there was Ramzan Kadyrov with his fight club and his own MMA promotion. He would later merge his MMA promotion, this WFCA, World Championships Fighting of Ahmed, something along those lines, terrible translation from Russian, and he would merge it with this organization that I mentioned earlier, my very first visit to Russia, this absolute championship Burkut, ACB. They would merge together and form absolute championship of Ahmed, ACA. So all these developments were really fascinating for me. While I was in Russia, sort of embracing the moment and the opportunity and learning from my experiences and building my network, I had also decided that, you know what, some of these stories are stories I really want to tell, starting with Ramzan Kadyrov. And I really started just delving into all the reporting that I knew. And I had built up a knowledge base from experiences in Russia and from sources who were willing to talk to me, of course, off the record due to the massive risks they could face if any anything had been discovered or Ramzan Kadyrov figured out who was speaking to me. But I was able to bring to life stories that no other mixed martial arts reporter could have done at the time. And that really put me on the map. But it also led to me basically being exiled from Russia. It was only a matter of time before M1 Global and other entities and other people started getting extremely worried, saying, listen, these people are now aware of who you are. They will know every time you are in Russia and we will not be able to protect you while we are here. If you are in Russia, all bets are off the table and they will know specifically where you are. It's not as if I could just, you know, if I was doing this as an actual reporter, I could land, I could you know, be as inconspicuous as I want, but that's very difficult to do when you're an English commentator and they'll have the list of all the upcoming events and will know the hotel where you're staying. It certainly made my position a lot more tenuous. And by mid-2016, I think, I had just taken part in my last trip to Russia. Don't ask me right now to list which specific M1 global event it was, but it was one of the ones that took place around June or July of 2016. I didn't know at the time it was going to be my last event, but that's how these things work, unfortunately. But where one door shuts, another door opens. And here is where my career went from this, you know, unknown explorer with these interesting opportunities uh, and this ability to tell these stories on a platform like Bloody Elbow. And I started being taken a lot more seriously as a legitimate reporter. And that actually occurred after a man named David Scott, this incredible journalist who I to this day consider a mentor. He reaches out to me on behalf of HBO Real Sports and says he's really fascinated with my reporting on Ramzan Kadyrov. This, I can legitimately say, was one of the turning points of my career. For the next year... David Scott and I would spend a lot of time on the phone. We would spend a lot of time emailing each other back and forth. And eventually we would meet in person multiple times. They f were able... In the beginning, he told me, listen, we're really interested in this idea of doing a documentary on Ramzan Kedyarov and his involvement in mixed martial arts. We don't know if it's going to happen. And I, I had been burned before. I had done all of these different stories about these experiences and things I discovered in Russia. A couple of my stories at this point had actually been optioned for films that never came to fruition. So I was really used to hearing these really great, big, optimistic ideas and then being sort of let down a few months later. So even with this HBO opportunity, I didn't... I actually didn't sort of expect it to go through immediately. So over the course of the year, it started becoming more and more of a reality that, oh my God, they're actually moving forward with this documentary. And eventually, David ended up visiting Chechnya and being one of the rare reporters to get a on-air interview with Ramzan Kadyrov. And this was a crucial moment. The fact that they were able to secure this interview made the documentary that was coming out one of the most important pieces to date on Ramzan Kadyrov. Not just in a sporting landscape, but generally one of the most important pieces on Ramzan Kadyrov. And at that time, during the course of our 
interactions over a year of me speaking with David and helping him with the story and talking him through it and explaining to him Ramzan Kadyrov. Kadyrov begins to, there are reports that emerge in 2017 that Kadyrov is purging his republic's LGBTQ plus community. Particularly, he was focusing on gay men. So they were luring gay men using all those dating apps, etc. And torturing them and then eventually killing them in some cases based on the sources that i discussed the killings were actually being placed upon the family members so the police would actually lead certain uh, accused gay people uh, after they've been beat beaten up back to their families and say you deal with them and you deal with them meant one specific thing according to one source of mine and for those of you who don't want to hear a violent incident, might want to skip forward for about 30 seconds. But one of my sources at the time told me that one of his friends was thrown off the roof of a building by his uncle for this exact same accusation. So, it was a very interesting and difficult and quite tragic time to be reporting on Ramzan Kadyrov. And I seem to have been in this strange storm and the timing was just right for that kind of reporting to flourish. And that's exactly what happened with this HBO Real Sports documentary. They came out to where I was living at the time, which was Toronto, and they filmed me. And I remember sitting there for five hours, five whole hours as they filmed me and asked all these different questions. David Scott gave one of the most thorough interviews and I think I gave every single ounce that was in me that day. Five hours is a long time to be speaking. I mean, I've been speaking for a little more than 30 minutes and I'm already tired right now, but it was worth it. In the end, they didn't use much more than five minutes of my, <laughs> of my interview, but it was still very much worth it. And about 25 minute piece to have five minutes of airtime on such a prestigious sports program at the time opened up a wide range of doors for me. Of course, it didn't make my life easier. I continued to receive death threats from Ramzan Kadyrov and his henchmen. And I had to learn at a very young age how to handle that kind of pressure, dealing with death threats, sifting through the various threats to determine which one is an active threat which is versus which one is an attempt at intimidation, sending these things to security teams and discussing it with them. I remember when I got nominated for my first MMA Journalist of the Year award, it was in 2017. It was a long discussion with my boss, Nate Wilcox at Bloody Elbow and with Vox Media before they actually let me go. And the following year, when I attempted to attend, when I was nominated yet again, they insisted that I could only go with a bodyguard. And I hated the idea so much of being followed around by a bodyguard that I said, no, I'm just not going to attend. And that just became my experience over the next few years. I would miss out on certain big events because I was always worried that something could happen. Because unfortunately, the threat was truly there, at least so I was so I had been told. So it was a very difficult time for me. I mean, I got married in the summer of 2018. And just because I had been so used to not geolocating myself, all our friends, all the people who had been invited to this destination wedding had been told very specifically not to announce where they were going and to be very careful with the pictures they posted and when people weren't even necessarily allowed to post pictures the day of it was it was in the following days thereafter. And that's not a way you really would want to live, is it? But as I speak to you now all these years later and as things have somewhat cooled down, I look back in that time with still no regrets. I don't think I would have done anything any differently. Especially since that specific reporting on Ramzan Kadyrov opened up so many opportunities for me. Shortly after the HBO documentary, I started doing reporting for The Guardian. I became a columnist for The Guardian and I continue five to six, nearly six years later to continue to do work for The Guardian. Eventually, it would be a Ramzan Kadyrov story that would get me into The New York Times. I did two Ramzan Kadyrov stories for The New York Times and have since done other reporting there. So, it's a very strange relationship I have with Kadyrov and this this reporting. For many years, I hated the fact that I was known simply as the Kadyrov guy or Kadyrov and mixed martial arts and being asked about that. And most of the interviews I was doing was about that topic when really I had such a wide range of knowledge and experiences that I wanted to share about all sorts of sports, about all sorts of places I travel to and other people who aren't as crazy and as ludicrous a human being as Ramzan Kadyrov. Yet... At the same time, while he is my curse, he has also been a 
opportunity and a platform for me to continue to be taken seriously and legitimately as a reporter. So in many ways, I owe his ridiculousness a lot in terms of my journalism. And I will continue to report on the awful behavior he does, especially since he continues to be relevant amidst Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I mean, there were reports recently that he might be dying, but he seems to be sticking around. And he makes that clear through the fact that he continues to attend mixed martial arts events. For those of you who have been subscribers to Sports Politica and prior to that, readers of my work for many years already know all these things about Ramzan Kadyrov so I'm not going to get into them all over again here. But it's just to say that it is very strange to me how he continues to remain relevant in my reporting. But at the same time, I've gone beyond that. And this year, and especially through Sports Politica, it's been an opportunity to showcase the fact that I'm interested in a wide range of sports. And I managed to really have a breakthrough in that regard earlier this year when I published a story for the New York Times about Leo Messi. Now talk about a full circle moment for me. The beginning of my fandom, and not just my fandom in football, but my awareness of the intersection of sports and politics began in 2007 at a Leo Messi match. Then, by 2023, I would reach one of the most important moments of my career, when I would make the front page of the New York Times on a Leo Messi story. Strange how the world works sometimes, isn't it? But enough about me for today. I think we'll stop there in terms of the storytelling, and we'll move on to what I will make as the final segment of the Sports Politica podcast generally, which will be where we will have a listener Q&A or an opportunity to engage with uh, specific reader questions if it's on a broader topic. But since this is our inaugural episode, I wanted to take this opportunity to read some of the comments that have been left for me by some of Sports Politica's most recent paid subscribers. Sean Singletary wrote, I appreciate honest journalism that doesn't blur lines and covers the topics that otherwise go ignored. Thank you for your work, Kareem. Well, thank you, Sean, for subscribing. It is truly much appreciated. Felipe Mello says, Thank you for the work you do, Kareem. It is often a thankless task to cover insidious sports washing, and your work is extremely valuable to catalog the increasingly mingling of political power and sports. Well, thank you, Felipe. I really, really appreciate that. And you're very, very kind with the words you say. I appreciate your subscription. This one from Carl Albert Rooster reads, I much appreciate the work you are doing. Through Richard Lewis and his channels, I found your content, and it is very inspiring to me. As a lifelong and deeply rooted sports fan, I have sought out unique individuals like yourself who are giving voice to all decent sports fans and enthusiasts who are not indifferent to what's going on and do not wish to see their sports sold out. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, Carl. I truly appreciate it once again. Thank you for your subscription and for reading my work. And finally, I'm going to end with this one from Jin. You write well. I'm glad you think so, Jin. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening to the very first edition of the Sports Politica podcast. Until next time, take care.